The goal of the mission 1000 Days for the Planet is to document the beauty and fragility of biodiversity on Earth. But we also realize that life in the oceans is truly threatened. Oceans cover more than 70% of the Earth's surface, and their volume is about 300 times more than land-based environments. So the oceans play a vital role in the balance of life on this planet. Life abounds in the Big Blue in a variety of shapes and colors, ranging from microscopic creatures to the last giants of the world. Unfortunately, our limitless exploitation of the oceans and our savage history with certain resources tell a sad tale. After nearly wiping out whale populations, we have developed ever more sophisticated fishing techniques, which have exerted an unsustainable pressure on ocean resources. Today, it is estimated that 87% of the oceans are overexploited or exploited to their very limits by the fishing industry. Large ocean predators have been especially affected by our insatiable appetite for resources of the sea. It is estimated that 90% of large fish have disappeared in recent decades. Despite their threatened status, the fishing industry still harvests about 65 million sharks each year. Sharks were long considered an accidental catch or bycatch on long liners, fishing boats that release kilometers and kilometers of fishing line into the sea aimed primarily at catching large fish. But sharks are no longer a bycatch. Today, they are targeted directly. In the past, there was no market for shark meat, but the recent development of the lucrative Asian market for shark fins has completely changed all that. The consequences for ocean ecosystems are disastrous. There are recent scientific publications that say that, in general, all marine predators have declined 90% in the last 50 years. So, you know, it's, it's not looking good. We've invited scientists aboard the Sedna, people who are passionate about what they do and who have dedicated their lives to saving the ocean's large predators. Biologists Pedro Afonso and George Fontes have joined the Sedna Four for this expedition. These scientists from the University of the Azores are also skilled fishermen who are able to catch a shark with a line and hooks specially designed not to hurt the animal. They will team up with Randall Arauz, a scientist and activist who has become well known internationally for his campaigns against shark fishermen, especially those who practice shark finning. Our first stop was the Azores in the middle of the Atlantic. It's a place I love. It's filled with history. It's a sailor's paradise. On the beaches, the docks, even in the bars, you can feel the history and smell the sea. Sailors love to stop at the small port of Horta on Fayal Island. Located on either side of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, the Azores Archipelago is the result of 20 million years of volcanic activity. The spectacular scenery of the islands, which have emerged only 5 million years ago, continues to evolve and change as a result of volcanoes and the movement of three major tectonic plates that meet here. In the oceans, sea mounts rise up to the surface, which brings up nutrient-rich waters that feed an impressive diversity of marine life. In sea mounts, you typically have upwelling um, events, that is, deep water that carries nutrients along the slopes of the sea mount to surface or at least to depths where the animals can profit from it. Sea mounts not only have more biomass or more animals, they have more species, including the top predators that might be travelers of the ocean, but that might stop on particular sea mounts because they have the increased productivity which they can profit from. Everybody goes to the sea mounts, including men, of course. Many migratory species appear to use these seamounts in some phase of their lives. But only recently have scientists discovered the important role played by seamounts around the world. We could probably try to do that like, again. Like at four One of the very first seamounts to be declared worldwide 
um, as a marine reserve for scientific purposes so we can understand the whole process from bottom to top is the Condor Seamount which was declared a marine reserve about three years uh, ago and this is just just outside Aldor which is a fantastic opportunity for all of us scientists, fishermen and managers to understand how these seamounts work so we can better protect them. The volcanic seamounts in the Azores cause nutrient-rich currents to rise to the surface, which attracts pelagic species such as hammerhead sharks, whose status is precarious and which are increasingly rare in the world's oceans. Hammerhead sharks are among the most endangered sharks. All pelagic sharks are reduced 90% during the last 50 years, but hammerheads are down 98, 99% in certain areas of the world, so they need a lot of help. The crew of the Sedna 4 hopes to install satellite tags on young hammerhead sharks that seem to use some areas of the Azores as a nursery. The hammerheads are naturally less abundant because they produce much less offspring to start with. Secondly, they uh, actually um, make what we call some kind of parental care to their offspring in the sense that they move to very specific habitats where females think that their pups are gonna have increased chances of survival during their first uh, months and, and years. So the nurseries of, of, of hammerheads are typically located in these very coastal areas, shallow uh, uh, inlets, uh, mangroves in the tropics. In the particular case of this hammerhead species, the smooth hammerhead, we think that oceanic islands such as the Azores might play a crucial role as nursery habitats for the North Atlantic population of this species. In places like the Azores, there has been no historical fishing pressure on hammerhead populations locally, and this continues to be the case, fortunately. However, the adults which live an oceanic lifestyle are also attracted to the long lines, the industrial long line, in open water. And they are indeed uh, a bycatch, a typical bycatch of this fishery. And that is exactly the reason why now ICAT has mandated the member states to forbid any landing of hammerhead species on the long line fleets. There is an era of research on marine ecology and behavior before the advent of electronic tagging and another one after the advent of electronic tagging. The capacity of these devices to open windows into the life of these animals and into the significance of particular habitats is just too precious for us to leave it behind. That's a female. That's a female. A hole. For years, maybe. Well, we think this site is a nursery, so we're going to attach an acoustic transmitter to this female so that we can find out whether she comes back next year. So these guys, they heal really fast. It's kind of warm. Yeah. About having this. We've attached the acoustic transmitter. We're going to move forward to oxygenate the shark, and then we'll attach the satellite transmitter. This satellite tag, called a pop-up, is quite distinctive. After 300 days, the tag will be released and rise to the surface, where it will send all its data to the satellite. This will provide detailed and accurate information about the shark's dives and how deep it went. And if it traveled any long distances during these 300 days, 
We'll learn that too. Okay. Okay, whenever you want. One, two, head first. Three. Without knowing it, this female will be providing scientists with vital data. They'll use it to learn more about her movements and eventually to help put protective measures in place for this extremely threatened species. To study the ocean's great migrators, we must travel great distances. With the same team of biologists, we're headed for Coco Island off the Pacific coast of Costa Rica. Coco Island is a paradise for both biologists and divers who come here from around the world. The marine biodiversity here is exceptional, and it's known for its abundant shark population. The sharks of Cocos Island migrate between Cocos, Galapagos, and Malpelo, Colombia. So it's really a shared population. This is very important because, of course, we can protect the sharks in Cocos Island as much as we want, but then they're going to go to other islands and they must be protected there as well. And also, let's say all three countries get together and say, okay, we have to protect them more when they're on these three islands, but what about when they're migrating in between? So we need the information now on when are the times where the sharks are migrating so that we can design, of course, the, the corridors. Our goal is to install a satellite transmitter onto a hammerhead shark. If we're successful, we'll gain a much better understanding of where these sharks go, and we'll be able to suggest protection measures. It's very urgent that we gather accurate data on the sharks' migration routes, so that we can adopt effective conservation measures. Catching a hammerhead shark will not be easy. They are very cunning animals, and there are fewer and fewer around Coco Island. And because there are many different kinds of sharks, our bait may attract other species. But it's very important that we get a satellite transmitter onto a shark to better understand how they move around in this area of the Pacific. There are many illegal fishermen around here, and we must put conservation measures into place quickly. Fortunately, you know, the government of Costa Rica recently increased the protection around Cocos. They're taking stronger actions against the illegal fishermen. I really hope we can curtail all these illegal fisheries and that we can somehow control, you know, the uncontrolled fisheries that are happening now in the eastern tropical Pacific because hammerheads definitely have dropped during this last year. The decline of shark species is caused by overfishing, prompted largely by the demand for shark fins, which can fetch up to several hundred dollars per kilo. There is a 12-mile protected zone around Coco Island in which no fishing is allowed. Obviously, the extraordinary biodiversity here attracts many poachers. We see them sitting just outside the 12-mile limit on our radar. The island has a monitoring system, wardens and boats, but they can't do anything when the poachers are outside the park. Yet we know very well that these poachers frequently enter the park because they have no notion of conservation. All they want to do is catch fish and sell it. When they come into the park, they often play a game of hide-and-seek with the park wardens. At night, it's the law of the jungle, and the poachers are much better at the game than the wardens. So at night, out at sea, there's a war going on. On the island, the evidence of poaching is striking. You see it everywhere. For example, this bridge across a small river was made from fishing boards seized by park wardens. The director of Cocos Island National Park agreed to talk to us about this serious situation. This is where we stored all the fishing gear. 
Radio Boya. We can see here a number of different kinds of boys. Do you see how many of them are painted? They do this to make them almost invisible and difficult for us to spot. We keep all the confiscated equipment here. As you can see, there is a lot. It's a big problem because it's all equipment that was set up in protected areas. We manage all of this as garbage. This here is the gear typically used by longliners. These are the lines and hooks used to catch shark. You know that the Cocos Island is also known as Shark's Island. Even our emblem is a hammerhead shark. And they are now an endangered species. There are pressure zones that are between 8 and 10 miles from the coast. The fishermen know when we're coming and sail off. So by the time we reach the point where we first spotted them on radar, they're gone. And that's where we find all this fishing gear. Sometimes they've even had enough time to cut or retrieve their lines by then. We say that fishermen are like sly hunters, an exotic species introduced into an environment into which they don't belong. And even though it's a big ocean, the ecosystem around the island is especially rich. We can't keep the fish in cages to protect them. This is where we keep the boys we retrieve. Most of them come from Taiwan and they paint them so they can sneak past the patrols. Look at the difference. This is one that hasn't been painted, and this is one that has. With the painted ones especially, we can clearly see the intention behind them to harm the protected area by fishing shark and tuna. We need to reevaluate our strategies to counteract this problem. We're not here just to patrol and protect. We need to take it further and work on reforming our fisheries and navigation laws. This is a magnificent place with a wealth of marine life worth protecting. That is the least we can do with what we have. We must quickly develop new protection measures here in the island and at a national level to protect the resources. The team of scientists continues its efforts, but the days go by and the large numbers of hammerhead sharks that Cocos Islands is famous for are still missing. The team decides to change the protocol. At this point, any species will do. The scientists must absolutely catch a shark for their research. Unfortunately, I'm not seeing the same number of hammerhead sharks. I used to see hundreds at the different stations in Manuelita, at Dirty Rock, in Alcyon. And about three trips ago, last year in September, we came and there were hardly any sharks, but the water was very warm. And everybody said, well, it's El Nino, the water's warm. The sharks will come back as soon as it gets cold. And okay, um, but yeah, the water's a lot colder now and they're not coming back. There was a place like this in Mexico, the Gulf of Cortez, and they had hammerheads just like here. And they wiped them out in the 90s. You know, they can be wiped out. The scientists have tried everything. They spread blood in the water to attract sharks, use baited buoys, anything to catch a shark.
One particular night was extremely frustrating. We were trying to catch a shark for science, and yet on our radar we saw poachers coming into the park and setting their lines. And they probably had a better chance of catching a shark than we did. There was nothing we could do except alert the wardens. They said they would try to stop them, but we knew very well that their chances of catching the poachers were slim. So we have a boat. You see the boat there? At what distance? It's about 12 miles away. It's about 12 miles away. It's leaving the Cocoa Island National Park limits. Are you heading right out to look for them? Yes, we're going straight there. Earlier, this boat came within three miles of ours. Clearly, it was completely inside the park boundary. So the fishing equipment could be just about anywhere. What they do is cast their lines, then leave the park limits. What they do is cast their lines and then leave the park limits. They'll remain outside at the 12-mile limit, where they cannot be caught. An important point to explain in all of this is that if we reach them, we will most likely find fishing here. But unless it's connected to the boat, we cannot prove that it belongs to them. The fishermen see us patrolling because they have radars like ours. And as soon as we start off towards them, they move further away. And so we can retrieve and confiscate the equipment. But unless the boat is right there, there is no way to prove anything. So unless the lines are actually connected to the boat, you, you can do nothing, even if the lines are only a meter away and full of fish. Exactly. For example, we can accuse them of illegal fishing, and two or three years later the case will end up in court. But when the judge asked the park ranger if he saw that the lines were connected to the boat, if the answer is no, and the captain denies that the lines were his, then the case is dropped. This is one of the biggest problems we face here in the Cocoa Island National Park. We know what the problem is. We just need to change the law so that every fishing boy is identified with a boat number. That would solve the problem. If a fishing boy is found inside the park with your boat number on it, you're guilty, period. Along the coast, measures to protect berthing areas are not much better. The team joins another group of scientists in Golfito Bay, in Costa Rica. The Tiburon mission team is studying the life cycle of young hammerhead sharks that gather in this bay. The biologists are working directly with some local fishermen to try and provide protection for female hammerhead sharks who give birth in the area. During the months of July and August, is when there is a jump in the number of, specifically, young hammerhead sharks being captured. This just confirms that it's the season in which female hammerheads migrate to the coast. They probably come in May or June and leave their pups to grow in this protected area because it is a safe nursery, rich in nutrients. Here they can live for their first two to four years until they're adults, until they can make the great migrations to other islands, such as the Malpelo and Galapagos, where adult hammerheads are often seen. This is our reality here in Gulf of Dulce and other areas along the coast of Costa Rica, where the hammerhead shark is often unintentionally caught by fishermen as bycatch. One of these fishermen has agreed to talk on camera. On average, how many hammerhead sharks do you catch every day? Depending on the area, in one day we can catch up to 100. 
sometimes more, in other areas, none. But whenever they're caught like this, most of them are already dead, up to 70 percent are already dead. These aren't illegal fishermen. They're simple family fishermen trying to make a living. But for two months, they fish right in the shark nurseries. The problem with this species is that it spends most of its time swimming to oxygenate itself. When these sharks get caught in the fishing lines, their movement is limited so they can't breathe and they quickly die. That's why during those months fishing in this area must be prohibited. Sixty-three, forty-eight, macho, male. Es un It's a newborn. It still has the opening from the umbilical cord. It's sixty-three centimeters in length. Hammerheads are born between fifty and sixty centimeters. That male is two weeks to a month old, no more than two months. He's ready for relax. An interesting fact is that in the Gulf of Dulce, there are more male than female hammerheads. It may be a strategy to ensure genetic diversity within the species. Come on, come on, go! He's stunned, but he'll recover. The capture of this young tiger shark is not good news. Other endangered species also appear to use the Golfito area to give birth among the mangroves along the coast. We're trying to protect the adults in their migrations, but we're leaving behind the young in the coastal waters. It's sad because we work hard to try and protect the hammerhead. And when we see these things, we become discouraged. It kills the flame. But at the same time, it's the reason we keep working. We need to know more about them to protect them. We need to work closer with the fishing communities to make their protection a reality. In Puerto Jimenez, there aren't many traditional fishermen, only around 20 to 30 families whose livelihood depend directly on traditional fishing. There are a lot of options in the area. There's a lot of tourism. There are even many other marine species during these months, like whales and dolphins. And these can provide some alternatives, like tourism. We have to work with the fishermen so they understand that the hammerhead is endangered and that these sharks are worth more alive than dead. You're free! The biologists of Mission Tiburon are doing fantastic work. They raise awareness with young people and fishermen, but it will take more than that. We need laws to protect the sharks' birthing sites and nurseries for these two critical months of the year. And we need to find a way to financially compensate the 20 or so fishing families during this period. It shouldn't be that hard. It probably costs more to send scientists somewhere in the world to meet two or three times to try and understand the problem than it does to implement real measures to compensate these fishermen. But we must absolutely find a way to protect the zones during these two critical months. The conservation problems in our oceans are caused mainly by overfishing. Governments know it, and scientists have been saying it for years. Even worse, scientists are saying that we have maybe 40 or 50 years to change our ways, or fish stocks will collapse. So if the overfishing problem isn't solved early in this century, there will be no more fishing at all by the end of the century. Longline fishing is non-selective. And every year, its bycatch kills a huge number of non-commercial fish, turtles, birds, and other species. One longliner can deploy up to 100 kilometers of line equipped with thousands of baited hooks. This type of fishing 
primarily targets large fish, such as swordfish, which are a good source of income for fishermen. But overfishing has reduced stocks to the point where revenues are not sufficient to cover the cost of the industry. The significant decline in swordfish populations has forced the industry to develop new markets. Long considered bycatch, sharks were once thrown back due to their low value. But the growth of the lucrative shark fin market has changed the strategy of the industry. There's very little known about sharks, and shark science only started until the 90s. And I think all shark scientists now share the concern that we're running out of sharks, and we really need to work together to generate the information we need and to get the political change we need. And One day, Randall managed to get a friend hired on as a cook on a fishing boat. The images he took documented for the first time what happens at sea, far from prying eyes. The footage shows turtles and all sorts of bycatch, but the most disturbing images are of what happens to the sharks. These were the first images of what's called shark finning. In its most barbaric form, the shark is brought on board, its fins and tail cut off, and then it's thrown back to the sea, often still alive. Obviously, without its fins and tail, the animal can no longer swim and circulate water through its gills, so it dies an agonizing death by suffocation. It's a cruel practice, and these images galvanized public opinion. First of all, it's a cruel, painful death for these magnificent animals. Uh, from a more technical point of view, it's unsustainable. They're wiping out marine biodiversity so that a culture on the other side of the world can have their shark fin soup. These images of shark finning helped raise public awareness, and some countries now ban the practice. But this has not stopped shark fishing altogether. What happened is that a new market has been created. Many countries now require fishermen to keep the shark carcasses. In a way, by creating a market for shark meat, we have legalized a once condemned practice. But nothing has really changed. We're putting even more pressure on shark populations. The way fisheries are controlled out here in the open sea, it's no man's land. It's everyone take all. Everything is for free. And that isn't changing yet. And I think that is something that many countries have to work on. The United States, the Economic Union, Australia, which is a big fishing nation. And, you know, we need to get together and change the way fishery policy is established. We have a very interesting relationship with the government of Costa Rica. However, we have a very bad relationship with the Costa Rican Fisheries Institute. The Fishery Institute is an autonomous institute, which means it's not part of the central government. And since it's autonomous, they are not ruled by the president. They are ruled by a board of directors. And guess who's on the board of directors? Shark finners, shrimp trawlers, tuna purseiners. So they're all there not to establish public policy. They're there to protect their own private interests. What we need is fisheries directed with science in mind. How many boats can fish this resource? When should we stop fishing? Where should we not fish? Then even if it hurts somebody's pocket, we must stop fishing. The fishing fleets have grown in the past decades dependent on subsidies from governments. That is, the real cost involved in sending a fishing vessel out there with all the costs in fuel, in gear, in paying the crewmen, etc., is just not uh, overturned by the real profit that the catch is going to make in the market. And the only reason why that fleet or that particular vessel is doing its everyday fishing is because it gets subsidies from all of us taxpayers to lower the cost of those, uh, uh, of those items. If we would be to take all the subsidies to the fishing fleets all over the world, and in particular in developed countries, most of those fleets would stop the day after. By creating a new market for shark meat, the fishing industry is committed to using much of the resource. But at 63 euro cents per kilo, less than a dollar, some wonder whether this new market for shark meat is not simply a cover 
for continuing the lucrative trade in shark fins. The effort to catch a shark off Cocos Islands continues. Time is passing and the scientists are redoubling their efforts. Pedro and George have been working day and night. There's no question of giving up. They can't leave empty-handed. The stakes are too high. If we want to effectively protect and conserve these highly migratory species, we need to figure out where the critical habitats are located, whether they are for mating purposes, for spawning purposes, or for juvenile growth purposes. This is the main issue. Finally, after many attempts, they catch one. It's not a hammerhead, but the team can still track its movements and learn the migration routes of this Galapagos shark. Vertebrates in general have this thing called the tonic immobility reflex, which basically is when you're turned upside down, you become numb. And they get really, really, really uh, amenable to work with. Um, and we think that they also get a decreased uh, pain function. We do that to promote natural anesthesia. Okay. Yeah, wherever. That's the tag. This is a female Galapagos shark. Uh, they just installed an acoustic tag inside it. This issues a sound that can be heard 500 meters around. And this tag will work for at least five years. So we expect to get some really good data because the tag is implanted inside the animal, so we're sure it's not going to be lost. Yeah, go for it. Quick action is needed. The scientists install the satellite tag. Okay, bottom one. Keep going for a while. Yeah. Well, the shark looks a little tired, and it's you know it's already been hooked for a few minutes, and I'm just a little concerned that you know the time it'll take to deploy the satellite transmitter on it might be a little too long. It is very invasive, but then at the same time, the, the information you get out of a single animal is so valuable compared to using other type of tags. But on the other hand very invasive and yeah you have to act fast Normalement, usually after the first stage of the operation we turn the shark over and move the boat to oxygenate the animal this revives it from its comatose state but this shark wasn't reacting we began to get anxious Okay, so see these are okay, yes. That's direction is good. holding now. Yeah, then you, you pull it in, yeah? You got the mine? All right, the hook is off. See, it's burning. Okay, it's going. It's going. It's going. In the end, it was just a scare. The female Galapagos shark regained her senses and swam off with the transmitter. So she will provide a lot of essential data for scientists. In the days that follow, divers managed to install acoustic transmitters on other shark species, including one of the few hammerhead sharks spotted around Cocos Island. This glimpse into the world of sharks and fishing really makes you think. Scientists have identified most of the problems, and solutions do exist. But if we want to save these threatened species, what's missing is a willingness to implement those solutions. This will probably mean making sacrifices and changing our consumption habits so we can change the model and build a different relationship with the oceans. If we want to preserve what remains of our oceans, we'll have to pay the price for our past abuses. I think there is no miracle solution to the biggest problem of all, which is how are we going to give 
uh, food to everybody while wild fish are just going lower and lower in numbers. Um, there is two main uh, hopes in our capacity to solve that. One is aquaculture, but we also know that aquaculture has a lot of environmental and even social problems associated with it, and we need to solve those. And the other is obviously a more sustainable management of global fishing uh, in the world. And that might take the exploitation of lower trophic chain resources, which can still give good protein to people and release a little bit our pressure on the top levels. So balanced harvesting is becoming a major hope in the fisheries science arena. We talk about sharks are going extinct, how important they are for the ecosystem, you know, and we go to meetings and we go to conventions and we design strategies and then we have meetings to see what went wrong with the strategy and then another meeting to, to push the strategy again and this time it is going to work, you know. So all this talk and talk and talk, but no action. Apparently what we don't have time. Scientists are saying we have another 40 or 50 years before it's all depleted. In our lifetime, we may see this big dramatic change and let's hope we can stop it. We need everybody's help. There are serious conservation challenges, but I'm optimistic. When humanity mobilizes, we can accomplish great things. We mustn't forget that everything on Earth is interconnected. We depend on other species for our own survival. If we can change the way we coexist with other species, I'm convinced we can get there. We can do it, I'm sure.